we're back. This is AWP 2016. I'm Rich Folley. We are right now sitting with Garth Greenwell, who's written a wonderful book, What Belongs to You. Mm -hmm. It's really nice to have you here. Thank you so much for having yeah. me. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this novel. Uh, a, a great excitement for this novel. Mm -hmm. You've created something that a lot of people are, are talking about. That mm -hmm. must feel good as a, as a writer, uh, first of all. Yes, it feels good. Good and, and kind of surreal. Okay. Yeah. yeah. A little scary. Everything you've worked for. You, you mentioned that you came out of the Iowa, Iowa Writers Workshop. Um, you obviously are hoping for something like this. And here you are with a book published by FSG, yeah. one of the most respected publishers on the, on the planet, uh, and doing very well and getting a lot of attention. So that's wonderful for you. Well, thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. Let's talk about the novel a little bit. It started, your, this novel started as a novella. That's right. Called Mitko. That's right. Um, and you, it, it was a successful novella. I think mm. it, it generated some attention. You were, yeah. people were aware of you. you. You stepped out into the world, but you decided to revisit it and turn it into a longer novel. What is it, first of all, about a project that sort of has that gnawing element? You, you didn't uh, leave it behind. You decided to go back right. and, and to keep working on it. What was it about Mitko, the, the novella, that decided it wanted to be a novel? I mean, that's an interesting thing, but you just said it the right way, because it really did feel like it was the book that decided it, not me. Um, you know, I, at no point writing the book did I have a sense of what it was going to be, or like a plan or architecture. Mm -hmm. um, and when I finished that first section, I really thought the story was done. And then the second section took me totally by surprise. And the same was true of the third section. Um, I mean, it really was a book. It was, a, it was the first fiction I had ever written. All of my training had been in poetry. And I really did write it sentence by sentence, kind of with no idea what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it didn't let go of you, though. I mean, I, I no, ask this yeah. not just as a writer, but as a person who thinks about projects in general. You, a lot of people sort of put the finishing touches on something, look at it, and go, that's nice, and move on to the next thing. But it, it called you. Well, and I think, you know, I think that probably had most to do with the place. I mean, you know, it's a book that begins and ends in a particular place, which is Bulgaria where I lived for four years and worked as a, as a high school teacher. And, you know, I think it was the place that wouldn't let go of me. Um, and it was such a, an extraordinary experience to be there, to be working with young people there, young Bulgarians, um, which I think there's a particular kind of investment you have in a place when you work with young people. And then also experiencing the kinds of communities that queer people form in places like Bulgaria, which reminded me very much in sort of strange and unsettling ways of the queer communities that people formed in Kentucky in the early 90s when I was a kid. And mm -hmm. it was that connection, really, between this place that, on, you know, in one way was very foreign, Bulgaria, and the way in which it sent me back to my childhood, which I really fled Kentucky when I was 16 years old mm -hmm. and had kind of spent my whole life... To Bulgaria, of all places, well, where gay life is not embraced either. Well, I think that's really the thing that made that connection, you know? I mean, you know, when I was 16, I left Kentucky and really felt like I was running away from it my whole life. And, I mean, Bulgaria, in one sense, seems like as far as you could possibly run, mm -hmm. you know? But actually, I found myself there thinking, sort of thrust back into my childhood and that mm -hmm. middle section of the book which is about the narrator's childhood in Kentucky um, I mean the book really sprang from this connection I made between Kentucky and Bulgaria and especially the kind of sort of horizon of possibility queer people see for their lives when they live in places where the only lesson they're taught about themselves is that their lives have no dignity and no value right mm -hmm. It's interesting that there, we're having a moment where we're reading a lot about gay literature and gay fiction, and the gay novel, the great gay novel, um, you know, that's coming out. Um, and and it, there's a more openness to it, certainly. But you look at, uh, this is not, your novel is not a novel of gay privilege, necessarily. This is a novel where there's still cruising bathrooms for sex in Bulgaria and going back to Kentucky, this, mirroring your own life, obviously, in both instances, right. and going back to Kentucky where you are, are made to remember why you wanted to leave in the first place, right. that there's still not a welcome embrace, uh, right. although it's changing, one would like to think. You know, I mean, I think it's, I think we're at this really interesting moment for queer people in certain very privileged parts of the world, um, you know, where we're able to tell this very, this narrative about queer liberation that's very flattering to ourselves, you know, but in fact, it remains the case that almost everywhere in the world, including almost everywhere in the United States, queer people are still fighting for their lives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I wanted to write about 
kinds of queer lives and queer communities that aren't accommodated by that kind of triumphant narrative of marriage equality, which, you know, really does package queer lives in a way that makes them look very much like straight lives. I mean, it makes those lives and the value of those lives legible to people who are disgusted by queer lives. That's how marriage equality triumphed in this country through a marketing campaign. Mm -hmm. And the tragedy of that, and I am a supporter of marriage equality, I think it was an essential battle, I think it's essential that we won. But the tragedy of that is that it further marginalizes and further victimizes the most vulnerable and marginalized parts of the queer community. And you know, I wanted to write about places like cruising bathrooms, which were, have been essential to my life since I was 14. I mean, cruising bathrooms were the first place I found a queer community, the first place I came into an understanding of myself as a gay man, and the first place where I experience queerness not just as a source of shame, but a source of joy. Mm -hmm. And I want to write about those places, which have become very difficult to talk about given this narrative yeah. of sort of queer liberation, I wanted to write about those places in a way that recognizes their moral and emotional richness. Mm -hmm. You know, because they are places where human beings interact with one another and enable each other's lives, mm -hmm. you know? And they're places that deserve to be spoken of, I think, with the reverence that all human value Mm -hmm. Deserves. Yeah, that's really interesting. The the notion of the idea of homonormative. That's right. Is a word that's not sort of made its way into our lexicon. I mean, the world is heteronormative for the most part, but yet homonormative with gay marriage, people think we're sort of moving into that world. But in a homonormative world, you you think about bedrooms, not necessarily bathrooms, as a place right. for, for sex. I would say actually, in the homonormative world, we don't think about sex very much at all. Yeah. Because you know, I mean, one of the ways that queer people have been made palatable and mainstreamed is by really desexing them. So if you think of something like Modern Family, which on one hand seems this incredible affirmation of the validity of queer lives, it's very hard to imagine those men having sex. Right. So you know, which is probably the way they want it on ABC. I mean, it's just probably yeah. the way they want it, <laughs> yeah. not just on ABC, but in America. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I would say that any genuine project of liberation has to have as its goal the multiplication of legitimate ways of life, ways of life that are validated and seen as legitimate. The danger of this sort of homonormative model is that it does the opposite. Mm -hmm. And that in fact, it suggests that only one model of life, the, a monogamous couple centered on the raising of a child, is a legitimate model of life. Mm -hmm. That's not acceptable. If we, ex if we allow that narrative to silence other kinds of queer stories, we give up way too much. Right. Well, you talked earlier about the fact that the, the fight for marriage equality was important. You thought it was important, and, and, and yet it is modeling itself after a hetero world and, and, a, and a normal world. For, is that the right way to go about it? What are your feelings about I the think, chase? I think that model of you know a monogamous couple centered on the raising of a child is a beautiful model of human life. It absolutely must be available to queer people. It's not the only model of human life. Right. And you know, part of the radical potential of queerness, I think, and the radical potential of places like these cruising bathrooms is precisely that. They're places where someone like the narrator of my novel, who is an American expat teaching English in Sofia, Bulgaria, can meet someone like Mikko, this young Bulgarian man with a seventh grade education whom he falls in love with. You know, these places, in these places, desire scrambles the categories by which we usually structure our lives, mm -hmm. categories like race and class. That's one of the radical things about queerness, that it does that, that it allows for face-to-face -face interactions. And anytime you have face-to-face -face interactions, I think, between human beings, I think there's the possibility of a kind of ethical spark that can leap across those great gulfs of privilege and those great gulfs of difference. And that seems to me a kind of radical possibility that we should cherish and value, not that we should allow to be erased from the kinds of stories we can tell about queer lives. Mm -hmm. you know. What do you think about the idea of gay fiction? You know, like Hannah Yanagihara's book, A Little Life, a which is book. really wonderfully received by all readers, um, and in fact does feature a number of gay characters, but it isn't necessarily the driving factor of the book. There is a couple characters in that book that um, that are openly, you know, brazenly gay. I mean, what are, you know, they're, they're out. Uh, in a, but on the other hand, the book is really about normal lives to a certain degree and friendships. What is your thought about the notion of the great gay novel or gay fiction in general? 
And is it necessary down the road? So I wrote an essay about Hanya Yanagihara's book in which I argued that it is a great gay novel. And you know, what I would say is so brilliant about that book. That it is a, the great gay is, novel. Not the great, go oh, okay. the great gay novel. Because I, I mean, I, <laughs> I don't think is. that's very interesting. You know, to sort of say one book is the great gay novel. Right. But that in fact, that Hanya Yanagihara's book is an aesthetically and socially ambitious book centered on the lives of men whose lives emotionally and sexually are devoted to other men. And one of the things that's interesting to me about that book, and that's brilliant about that book, is that I think it scrambles the whole idea of sort of normalcy versus queerness or, or gayness, you know? And it co really complicates those categories by which we define ourselves in ways that seem to me true to how we live. And so, you know, I mean, that novel, there's been a debate about, you know, whether it makes sense to call that novel a, a gay novel. It is a novel about men who love men. And it's a novel about men who build communities that have shapes that are different from that heteronormative or homonormative model of a monogamous couple raising a child. Right. And, you know, and that's to me why, I mean, it, it seems to me that that book receives such an extraordinary response from the gay community because, I mean, it did portray these lives in a way that felt to us, feels to us, meaningful and new and rich and complex. I mean, I do. I think it's a, it's a very brilliant book. And I, I mean, I would argue it is, a gay, it is a gay book and that aesthetically it's a gay book, the way that it embraces melodrama and a kind of operatic expression of feeling and a kind of rejection of, of realism. I mean, all of those things align it with queer aesthetic traditions, as does the extraordinary image that Hanya Yanagihara fought to be on the cover, which is an image, you know, by the great queer photographer Peter Hujar, you know, who is one of the iconic queer artists. Mm -hmm. I, I know the cover. I don't. I didn't know the story behind it. Yeah, it's a. It looks like a pained person. I mean, that's right. And to me, there's a lot you read into that when you see the cover, and then you think about some of the subject matter. That's right. And to me, the idea of painedness is something that um, has always come along with the gay experience yeah. in America. Yeah. Especially for someone from Kentucky who went to right, work in sure, Bulgaria. Sure. Um, and yet there's a, another side emerging now that's, you know, uh, an Anderson Cooper model, you know, right, where like life is good and it's a, it's a right. secondary element of their life. It's not even something they talk about. Well, but you know, I, I mean, I think, I think it's kind of misguided to talk about primary or secondary elements, you know, because Sexuality is not just sex acts, right? I mean, it's also communities, it's also culture, it's also, you know, I mean, no one would sort of say that, you know, heterosexuality is secondary to the life of, you know, a man or a woman with children, you know, who lives every day, even on days that they don't have sex, they are in, you know, relationships that are all about kind of a heterosexual model of mm -hmm. culture and of life. And I think the same thing is true of queer people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say, I do think that there is this very fascinating new kind of gay subjectivity, which was one of the things I wanted to, sh to sort of explore in my novel, and this changing shape of gay shame. Because it is absolutely true. I mean, the narrator of my novel is different from the narrator of queer novels, say, 30, 40 years ago. He's out. He's unashamed of his sexuality in sort of the ways we're accustomed to. Mm. You know, I mean, he has spent decades steeped in the language of gay liberation, he knows that the lessons he was taught about his life as a child are false. He knows that they're bankrupt. And yet, he will never get to be a person who was not taught those lessons and who was not shaped by those lessons. Mm -hmm. And so that particular quality of shame, where, you know, at one and the same time, we are who we are because of lessons we have rejected. You know, I mean, that is a, the sort of peculiar moment of gay subjectivity we're in right now. And mm -hmm. I, I hope that that's what my novel explores. Mm -hmm. I think it does. And, uh, and you're a fine spokesman for it, Garth, <laughs> for sure. Uh, what you. Belongs to You, a novel, Garth Greenwell, a wonderful book. Thank you so much. And uh, a really interesting conversation. Thanks so much for being here, first Thank of all. Thank you so much for yeah. having me. Thank